Hello, Paul. Turn on your video and say hi. Did you get any rain this afternoon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of thunder. No rain, not even a drop. I had turned my sprinkler system off about three weeks ago when the summer rain started. Yeah. And I actually got a telephone call from Seminole County asking, is everything okay with your second meter system? I said, yeah, I guess so. I said, well, we don't show any consumption. And I said, <laughs> correct. I shut off my sprinkler system. Why did you do that? Because it's been raining. I said, oh, okay. Just making sure everything's working okay. <laughs> so, and that was Seminole County? Yeah, Seminole County. Um, my, my, my water bill, and, and by the way, it's going up, but my water bill had been in the neighborhood of about $110 to $120 a month. And it was 70 some odd this month. Hmm. That's all because I didn't have to put water in the pool and I didn't have to run the sprinkler system. Craig, have you got your video camera and can you say hi? I can. How you doing? Okay. It's been a while. Yes, it has. <clears throat> good to see you, Craig. Well, it's always good to be seen. <laughs> yes, it is. Considering <laughs> the alternative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's been an interesting summer. Change my view to gallery here. Okay. All I show you muted and no video. So I'm hoping to hear some interesting stories from Huey as uh, his job as a poll worker. Today's we won't hear it tonight. He doesn't think. No, he... I know not tonight. Yeah. But when we next get a chance to talk. Yeah, there's Paul. How are you, Paul? Busy. <laughs> You're never not busy. <laughs> so uh, at around seven o'clock and seven thirty and eight. I got my simultaneous thing that I'll take a few minutes off. A simultaneous thing? Yeah, I got another event. Oh, okay. Yeah, tonight is also the Chicago Computer Society's Linux uh, SIG. But I may try to get to that if we don't last very long and see how see what they've got doing. Something you're expecting a few more than four people? Yes. <laughs> Ever know how many though for sure. Yeah, we publish that it's at seven o'clock, but some people like us <laughs> come in early. I just never know if it's going to work. So I thought I'd poke in early. And here's Sean Kane. So Windows sent out uh, 22H2 last week. It's got the prompt to put it in, Windows 10 anyway. Didn't notice anything different, which is fine with me.
No, is that 10 or 11? Windows 10. I don't know if, if I don't know if window 11 is a simultaneous release or not. Yeah, I tried to update uh, 11 today and nothing came in, but 10, I thought yeah. had updated. There's Sean. Yeah, Apple has gotten uh, some major updates due to some flaws, I guess. Yeah. That's been discussed. That was discussed on Tech for Senior. And it was also discussed on Leo Laporte's The Tech Guy. You talking on the phone or are you talking? Talking, just basically, since Sean joined us, he's our. Apple SIG coordinator. Yeah. Oh. Hey, Sean. Did you, does Apple send out a, a prompt to do their urgent upgrades or does, do they just automatically set it to do it when your computers or your device is idle? Well, with the phone, it, it was just <clears throat> available. It didn't I didn't get a notice or anything. But when I went in to update on the phone, it said it was critical. It was a uh, uh, some kind of flaw they were fixing. Yeah, <clears throat> there. It depends on how it's set up on your device. So if you have it set for automatic updates, then it would uh, automatically do it. Spy counter spy keeps the uh, software engineers busy. There are also supposed to be another Apple um, conference to do uh, announce new equipment this fall. I think Leo Laporte was talking about it not being on a usual Monday because of Labor Day. That it was going to be on a later day that week or something like that. Three minutes on my atomic clock until seven o'clock. That's what I have on the computer. Just ticked over to six fifty-eight. I still have a years-old Radio Shack LCD screen digital clock on my wall, about the size of a uh, small tablet, I guess, with a big plastic diesel all the way around it. And it's got a little antenna that tells me that it's synchronized to the atomic clock. I miss Radio Shack. Yeah. Of course, I miss CompUSA too. Yeah. HH -H Greg, they're gone. Yeah, I think the last three hard drives I bought were from from uh, online. They just show up. Yep. I typically buy from Amazon, but once I got my uh, my new large screen TV from Best Buy and I bought their whole home protection plan for anything that you own that you 
purchase from Best Buy, I look on Best Buy first and compare prices before I before I go looking on Amazon. Yeah, a friend of mine that always calls me for techie advice, I recommended that he go to Best Buy and buy the membership. <laughs> it cuts down on phone calls. I think Costco is, I don't know, got an extremely competitive situation with, uh, I, I'm not sure who it is that they're using nationally, but. Uh, Probably yeah. Assurian. They seem to be cornering the market. Even Best Buy, who used to do it themselves now, is Assurian for fulfillment. Oh, oh, really? They don't do it themselves anymore, huh? Not anymore, no. So are Geek Squad employees Assurian employees? That's a good question. But if you've got a problem with something that's it used to be called the Geek Squad Protection. Now it's Best Buy Technology something or other. But um, when you've got a problem, you don't call the store. You call the national Geek okay. Squad number. And you're, you're actually talking to an Assurian phone okay. telephone center. Right. Mike, did you let Drew and uh, Dick Vogel in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm in. I, I see him. Hello, Dick. How are you? I'm lucky to actually I'm not unmute myself. myself. Doing fine, Stan. Good, good. Keeping keep the medical profession employed. It looks see. like it. Some bandage on your ear. Yeah. I thought maybe you had a new uh, electronic uh, listening device or something. Absolutely. Mike, I have to, I never got back to you to tell you that when you made that uh, offer, remember the, the P Cloud offer that you advertised uh, some months ago? Uh, I did sign up for that, and that has just been really great. It's nice to have a cloud storage that uh, you pay once and then you're done. You know, they just they just did it again a week ago, I think. I think that's what it was. About a week ago or so, it was like a three or four day offer. And it, it, this time it was for a full family. If you wanted to share your drive with multiple users. Ah. So. Yeah, I've been without Comcast internet all afternoon. I was just about to use my cell phone as a hotspot for this meeting. Where are you located? Um, Sarasota, Florida. Yeah, okay. They knocked it out to my community. The whole community was out. How does it come in? Cable, fiber? What's, what do they use? Um, well, I have regular coax coming into my house, but I don't know what they ran around the complex. They Xfinity or Comcast at the time wired the network however they did when the complex was built 20 years ago. So it's all underground wiring. I don't know what kind. But I saw the big truck at the entrance way to the, the complex when I was pulling out this afternoon. And I just got it back about a half an hour ago. But it's been out since two. Well, I still use Spectrum. I was disappointed that Mike has uh, had so many problems with Spectrum. I guess it sort of depends on where you are as to uh, which service offers the best um, the best support and everything, reliability. Spectrum just increased their default speed, base speed from 200 to 300 megabits. I saw something in the paper just yesterday that something like 74% of the people in the Tri-County area, um, Orange, Seminole, Osceola, use Spectrum. Uh, 
have everybody else dribs and grabs five, ten percent kind of thing. They did not even mention T Mobile. The spectrum had been so sporadic here in the last year. And uh, Sean and I were doing a lot of troubleshooting on the network, trying to figure out if it was their signal, if it was my setup, if it was my router, et cetera. And um, when AT&T trenched in our community and put in fiber and came out with a $50 a month plan at 300 and Spectrum in space is 200, I said, okay, um, and, and I could go up if I wanted to as high as 400 right now and eventually 800. But um, I just decided, okay, I've given you enough leeway, enough rope spectrum, you finally hung yourself. And uh, I went ahead and switched over, which I'm on now. But a week after I had made the switch, spectrum's digging contractor showed up and started tearing up our side yard and the street, and bringing in heavy cable and a bunch of other stuff. And I said, what's going on? And they said, we've got some bad cable in your neighborhood and we're gonna replace it all with new cable. And this was, I mean, big, you know, I don't know, inch across diameter coax cable, big heavy stuff. And uh, they sunk that about, uh, had to be about five feet down because some of these guys standing in there were up to their shoulders in the trench. And they laid all that new cable and put in new boxes. But it was too late for me to switch back, and I, I didn't want to anyway. At least the squirrels can't get to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're officially past seven. So who would like to start off? Uh, who has something they would like to share and wants to start the meeting off? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about what Tech for Senior would like me to look at uh, in the coming months. I've been doing a series on solar photovoltaic for one's home, and I've got a series of videos which I'll share to the TechSig once, once the whole series is done. But it's about every three or four weeks I've been doing that. And Ron Brown asked me if I would segue that into electronic vehicles, since that seems to be the direction this country is going in. So I thought I would show in some of my research what General Motors has declared. I share my screen here. Let's see what we got. Okay, let's so we are looking at, hang on, let's see if I can get rid of that little drop down, which is uh, Control Alt Shift A, Control Alt Shift H. There we go. Okay, so this is General Motors website, and it's their page on electrification. And they've come out officially and said by the 2030s, they're going to be a 100% electric car company. No more hybrids, no more internal combustion engines, no more diesels. Everything is going to be electric. And this is kind of their new G Wiz webpage, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, they're showing this is going to be essentially their lineup from left to right. You can see the, the big panel truck, uh, their multiple person vehicle, which can be a commercial vehicle or personal vehicle. They're, they're electrified um, truck. Um, they're, they're uh, new car, uh, another truck, uh, their SUV and another car, but all electric. And they're going to a new platform. And this is their platform. And it says this is a simulated battery. So I'll see, watch video. Hopefully this will come through. Let me know if it if you don't see it. Yep. Yeah. 
I don't think speed. I don't think speed is really a big factor. I think endurance is more of a bigger factor. Did that come through okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, so that's their video. These are the names of, this is actually, now this is a Chevy Blazer. Now, if I think of a Chevy Blazer, I'm thinking of, you know, a, a vehicle that's kind of like a Jeep, but it isn't anymore. It's going to be a Blazer EV and it's a four-door car. Um, that's okay. That was the Hummer pickup that I said was going to be sort of the truck SUV. And then they're going to have the Hummer SUV, uh, the Cadillac, Lyric, the Silverado, it's going to be an EV, the Equinox, okay, that's so that's going to be their low-end passenger car, and the Origin, which looks like something out of Star Wars, is could be a taxi cab, could be a people mover, um, could be, you know, anything, probably ur an urban vehicle, and uh, I'm sure... There's no steering wheel. Well, no, mirrors, no pedals. Well, you can sort of see. Well, these look like cameras on the side. So, but that's, you know, to me, that's, or, you know, it's like you hire a car and this thing swings by your residence. You get in, you tell it the destination and it takes you there. And, and I've seen that in a lot of science fiction movies too. You know, we see that. You can't tell whether it's coming or going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is their platform, and it's called the Altium. And it's, they say it's a game-changing electric vehicle platform. So you can see it's designed around a battery pack, and it's designed around four wheels. And then that particular platform can be made longer, shorter. Each one of these is a module, and it can be designed for, you know, four four seats, a single seat vehicle. Uh, it's just, it, it's, that's what everything is going to be based on. So they say, and it's supposed to have excellent range, supposed to. Um, and let's see what else we got here. Okay. Recharging. They're, they're talking about delivery trucks in the cities. Now I don't, I didn't see in this design uh, a long haul uh, 18 wheeler, if you will, very much like what Elon Musk is developing uh, for his electrified 18 wheelers that are supposed to do the highways. But I would imagine their truck division will be working on something to compete with him. And let's see what we got charging, Ultium charge. You know, okay, let's see what they've got to say about that. Access to public charging and charging in general uh, is critically important. It's really one of the biggest things that holds people back from considering an EV today. What we're doing is trying to make public charging and home charging even more accessible. Ultium Charge 360 will be an integration of products services, networks that we design to enhance the customer's electric vehicle ownership experience. Just recently, uh, General Motors announced that we are investing $750 million through 2025 in EV charging infrastructure. There are about 85,000 chargers that exist in the US and Canada today. We're going to deploy up to 40,000 additional chargers over the next few years through this dealer community charging program. In the U.S., 90% of U.S. population is within 10 miles of a GM dealership. With the dealer community charging program, what we're going to be doing is giving every dealer 10 level 2 destination chargers that they can deploy in their community. General Motors is investing with EVgo to deploy about 3,250 DC fast chargers over the next few years. That investment is really enabling EVgo to build out that infrastructure much faster. Early next year, we're going to be introducing the first lineup 
of Altium branded electric vehicle supply equipment, level two chargers. Because these are designed by the same people who are designing your vehicle. So you can count on them to be reliable, dependable. We believe that open charging infrastructure for all will continue to help us accelerate EV adoption more quickly across North America. We're really writing a new chapter in the fusion of tech and transportation and mobility. So charging has been, to my mind, the one of the biggest impediments to going all electric. Uh, Tesla, of course, set up their infrastructure, and there's two or three networks that they that they just showed you in that diagram that come up with independent commercial charging networks. But the biggest problem has been with most of the cars that exist today is you got to stop somewhere to charge. Now, if you're going on a long distance trip, you know many people plan their gassing up at at uh, gas stations for maybe once every three hours or so and maybe get a hamburger or sandwich or something like that and get on the go, but they don't really want to sit there and have to wait in line to get to a charger and then have to wait for the charger and then have to charge for an hour to an hour and a half or choose a lesser charge. Say I can only get to 60% charge in 30 to 45 minutes. So having more of these at every location is supposed to make it easier to get to them um, over on Red Bug Lake Road <clears throat> near us, a brand new car wash and charging facility either just opened or is in the process of opening. And I believe they have something like 20 chargers, two banks of 10, uh, and a car wash facility, and then a, a lounge inside to go in and buy stuff. And it, it just is part of, an, part of a couple of different networks. You can just go in with your network card and your credit card and swipe it and, and get a charge and be on your way, theoretically. And several of you who know that I have solar PV on my roof also know that I have a uh, plug-in hybrid from Kia and I have a solar PV system on my roof and on sunny days, these days, sunny mornings, um, I can use a 220 volt plug and an adapter and I can charge uh, my car, my car's battery to 100% in about four hours if it's if it's completely drained, which it usually isn't. And that gives me 26 miles of pure EV before I have to then go to hybrid. So for just driving around here, going to meetings or shopping or whatever, most of what I do is electric. But not everybody who gets an electric vehicle is going to go put solar on their roof. And then the question is, okay, uh, is, are their rates from the utility company going to go up? Right now, it costs me about 13 cents a kilowatt hour if I use pure um, network, pure grid power, um, and probably, so less than a dollar, really, to charge my car from the network and nothing if I use my solar but I just can't see those rates staying the same as more and more demand is put on our grid. So that's going to go up. So these commercial chargers theoretically are going to answer that, but what are you going to pay for your electricity? So uh, something to think about. Anyway, this is, this is one site. It's gm.com. Um, and from the main gm.com, you can go to commitments and electrification and it's, it's company commitments, electrification. <clears throat> you can see the same thing and go deeper into it if you, if you wish. One other site that um, I was referenced to, and I'll go to that just to, no, that's the same one, sorry. And this one, I, if I remember correctly, Huey came up with it. And uh, it was in the, uh, it was mentioned anyway um, on Tech for Senior. And it's every electric vehicle that's expected in the next five years. It's carandriver.com news and then drill down. And I'll put that link in the, in the uh, 
chat if you want to look at it. But it's very, very extensive, a lot more than I thought in terms of the manufacturers that will be A to Z essentially coming out with electric models. <clears throat> so uh, many of these are going to be top line models, especially if they're top line brands, like don't expect to pick up a Bentley for $20,000. But um, most of them, most of them are pretty well known. Now here's Buicks <coughs> that wasn't on the GM line. So it was kind of speculation, but that you can see is pretty much built on that platform we were talking about. You know, you've got your, your four wheels on a main platform with batteries underneath, and then you've got a body to go with it based on how the interior is set up and how the door arrangements are set up. Never heard of a Byton, but it's an individual company and it, they, you know, there's, there's people that, or there's companies that think they can come up with their own models and compete with, with major industry. That's the Cadillac that we saw. Um, here's a weird looking pickup truck. Almost looks like one of those weird Teslas. So I won't go through this whole, and now this one almost looks like that weird model we saw that GM had come up with. I'm sure people are gonna copy each other seven seat EV. So I won't go through A to Z, there's a lot here. So I'll, I'll copy this and, and put it into chat. And you can take a look at it. <coughs> and then finally, and I don't have the links at the moment, so let me stop sharing. I think if I just hit escape, it will bring up. Yeah, it did. Finally, one of the biggest concerns that I always hear when people say, I just can't see this country going 100% EV. You know, the batteries just aren't out there. Uh, rare earth materials are hard to get. Uh, they're not gonna last that long. You know, typical things, you know, at the turn of the century, they'd be saying, you know, a gasoline engine just won't ever replace a horse. But we're, we're at the turn of the, the next century at this point. Um, and new battery technologies and materials are being developed, which are supposed to improve the capacity of batteries and minimize the rare earth uh, materials that are going to make them up. So I think over the next five to 10 years, we will see some major changes in battery technology that will facilitate the implementation of electronic vehicles. And then finally, is getting the prices down to compete with buying, you know, a, a regular new car. And uh, a good friend of mine just finished a six-week, long, probably longer, eight-week process of buying a new sedan. Insisted he wanted a sedan similar to his uh, Nissan Altima, and. Uh, didn't want a Nissan Altima because he couldn't get a hybrid. He wanted better gas mileage. And working with him, giving him some advice, helping him with some of his research, he settled on a hunt from day launch hybrid. Well, prices of cars since I bought my Nero in 2018 have easily gone up 20, 30, 40%. So my Nero, when I bought it, was a MSRP car of about 33,000, which I was able to negotiate a price through a car buying service of about 28. And then when I got out the door and all the dealer garbage that they throw on there, it was right around 30, 30 grand when I bought it. His car, the MSRP was 30, and the cheapest he could get it for out the door was 39,000 for everything. And so you're talking about, other than the fact that it's a hybrid, so you're paying a couple thousand more for that. So you're still looking at a fairly expensive price to get a brand new car, if that's what you want. And fast forward 20 years, most of us won't be in the car buying mode 20 years from now, but fast forward 20 years, when people are saying, well, get a used car. You know, but 
now the used cars 10, 20 years from now are probably going to be in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range, and if they're gas, the infrastructure for gasoline is probably going to be much less, and the cost per gallon is going to be probably more prohibitive than charging an EV. So, I don't see the the impetus, the momentum that's building for EV vehicles to lessen, and uh, a lot depends, of course, on the administrations that are in power and what their incentives are, what Congress does and a lot of other things. But it looks like, you know, the horseless carriage is pretty much has taken over from the horse and it looks pretty much like EV in some way, shape or form over the next five, 10 years is going to displace um, petrol powered vehicles, gas or diesel or so on. At least that's my perspective on it. Well, my next career change, I think I'm going to get ahead of the curve. I'm going to become a tow truck driver. Because I think, I think that's going to be a great job to have on the expressways. Because I think you're going to see people pushing the curve and be stuck everywhere. It'll probably be, a, it'll probably be an electric tow truck. <laughs> well, that's OK, because you'll be sitting on the road waiting for the call. You won't have to drive around. Well, there's also, if you think about it, there's been some, you know, the, the self-driving vehicles at one time, it was proposed to change all of the interstates, just as we did when the interstate system came in, change all interstates construction to a kind of a, a guided interstate with lanes exclusively set up for self-driving vehicles, which would have equipment that you would get on it driving it as you would normally drive, get to an on-ramp for these limited lanes, come on, press a button, and your car would switch over to self-guided to embedded cables in the roadway, which would then keep you on it until it was time to exit from that. You'd get your warning, you'd take back over, come back off and get off of it. And along with that, several people said, well, you know, it is possible to put electrified uh, cables that could do, do magnetic charging of the vehicles that are running that and, and charge the cars as they're, as they're running along the self-guided tracks. Major infrastructure change, but so were the railroads, you know, back in the 1800s to today's day. So again, can, can economies even afford to do something like that. But if you've taken the next 10 to 20 years to go 100% EV, and along the way they're building up these self-guided systems, and they're, if the road structure changes to accommodate that, you may pay a tax to do that, and you may run your credit card through some device in your car when you get ready to get on this thing, and it'll keep track of how much energy you've drawn from it charge your car up to keep it going and you'll pay for, you know, buy the trip or something like that. I take off my prognosticator goggles now. <laughs> Is there a standard interface for connecting your car to the charging station for all the different brands? Um, change is to R and interface to interfaces. Yes, there's there's NEMA standards. Uh, obviously, Tesla came up with their own, their, their uh, supercharging network. So it's, it's a high amperage, fast charging DC network. And Teslas have a plug that's unique to them. However, there are adapters that then allow that to connect to home chargers and, and other charging networks and the other way around. So if, this, if the network that you charge your car in is not specifically a Tesla network, but it's one of the, I think it's Charge America is one and there's, there's at least one or two others that are out there. <clears throat> there's several around the Orlando area already that I've seen. And they have several different plugs at each charging station with adapters and or you carry an adapter in your car. 
So the adapter that's on my Nero, my Kia Nero, is a, it's a standard adapter that can be used either for 110 or 220. And then at the other end, I've got a, a, a charging box and an adapter plug that goes into what looks like a dryer plug that goes into the receptacle that my electrician put in for me. But I can use that plug and I can also use a 110 charging plug that came with the car. And I can plug in anywhere that there's a, a 110 out let, but I bet, you know, I got to, I want it to fully charge from an empty battery. I got to be there for nine hours. So I've, I've gone to a friend's house down in Sarasota through, uh, oh. got down there. You know, I, I used electric to get on to uh, four and then I was in hybrid until I got off and electric to get to his house and electric driving around Sarasota until it was used up. And that night I just took out a 110 charger, put it on an extension cord to his house. And the next morning, the, the battery was fully charged. So, so you, you can do overnight on a foreign one, standard 110. Yeah. Well, on my battery, because it's not a full EV now, it's only, as I say, it's only designed for 26 miles pure EV. And then you go into hybrid mode. Okay. So if I were to buy a Kia Nero EV today, the battery pack is about four times as large. And yes, it would, at 110, it would, it would take a couple of days probably to, to charge it from empty. But then I also get a 300 mile range. So I could get, right. you know, I could go from Orlando to Sarasota back home again on one charge. Yeah. Where's, all the, where's all the electricity coming from? There you go. Yep. Nuclear power, solar power. <laughs> That's right, because somewhere that fuel has to come from somewhere. I know. Well, we'll repurpose the oil. How do you repurpose the oil? Well, you know, a lot of people don't even think about it. I see this all the time. Um, here's a remote control unit, right? Nice little remote control unit. Guess what that's made of, other than the copper and the solder and petroleum. Oil. It's made of oil. It's plastic. Okay, now look around you. How many things just where you're sitting are not plastic? And where does all that come from? All this nasty oil, you know? So they're gonna have to come up with something because Millions of years ago, the dinosaurs decided to deposit themselves, but uh, and eventually it'll run out anyway. But at the rate we're using it and not allowing additional drilling, uh, it's sooner now, rather than later. Now the auto manufacturers have a have a plan for twenty years, thirty years down the road. I wonder if the oil companies have a plan for what they're going to be doing twenty years down the road. Charging more money. They'll have to find a new way to gouge people. Well, my shirt is uh, cotton acetate or something like that, or cotton poly or whatever. So there's oil in my shirt, you know. Mm. It's, you know, all these things. They're, they're, they'll have to come up with something. Plant well, fiber. Well, they may own, they, ultim they may ultimately own a lot of the charging stations. Oh, yeah. Pro provide people with a lot of, you know, with electricity rather than oil. Yeah. <clears throat> I may have to go get my C7 Corvette earlier than I could. Well, just do an electric conversion on it, Paul. And I don't have any gas leaks as I've been having lately. <laughs> I find uh, this whole thing's kind of comical because a lot of this is driven by the people in California who routinely run out of electricity every year, every summer. They run out of electricity. Oh, we should have electric cars now. Okay, let's see where that gets you. I have, I have two sisters and their families out in California, so I hear about it all the time. <laughs> they don't get it. They just don't. I think, I think the fact that General Motors wants to become 100% electric in 10 years is short-sighted. That's just me. 
we'll see what happens. Well, Ford, uh, there was just, in fact, I think it was the Tech for Senior newsletter. They put out, a, no, I'll take it back with Ron. Ron Brown sent me a, a direct link to an article that Ford is laying off uh, 3,000 people uh, because the plants are producing more uh, more computer components, electrical components. They need software engineers, and they're doing less and less internal combustion engines and transmissions and all the kinds of things that that they are, you know, using their their uh, auto workers for. And they're laying off. Or I think it was thirteen thousand, not three thousand. Thirteen thousand people. So. Newspaper had 3,000. Was it 3,000? Okay. Yes. Okay, then I had the, the number wrong. So 3,000 sounds like a drop in the bucket, but it's also a sign of the times. And if you look at any of the manufacturing plants right now, Tesla is one of the biggest ones, but any of the manufacturing plants for vehicles, and you see the assembly lines in the videos, they're there on YouTube. Uh, Robotics is a major portion of the workforce. The welding, the, the major lifting and assembly. Yeah, there's still stations where guys climb in and will position something, but it's a robot or, or a, a uh, mobile uh, uh, computer controlled station that has brought the part to a particular location to bring it to the worker for him to guide it, for it to be put into the car, for him to turn a few bolts. So the workforce in the plants is, you know, slowly but surely being automated. Unless, unless okay. and the labor. But how does that relate to electric? Everybody converting to electric, but what, how does that? Well, how did you less, less people required to do mechanical stuff. And then if, if you don't have to build an internal combustion engine, if you don't need a rear axle and it's all gear and it's gear. You don't need a drive shaft. Uh, you don't need constant velocity joints. You don't need you don't need fuel pumps. You don't need all these other things that people have to be specialists on and install. Then for the electric vehicle, well, we just saw a platform. Essentially, it says you can take this platform, drop in a couple of battery packs, and choose the body that you want. And the seats that you want and everything else push a button and it gets a okay You're, you misunderstood me my the reason i think it's short-sighted is because there should be there should be multiple types of fuel available they should make vehicles that are either electric or hybrid or gasoline there's why why make such a drastic statement to go to 100 electric in 10 years that's, that's ridiculous I, I just don't, I understand that they're going to save some money doing that and, and on the back end, but there's going to be, there's still going to be gasoline and why not let the market figure it out? That's another thing. This, the whole thing with the, with the government making these rules and everything and having to control things, let the market figure this stuff out. Why? I, I, I just don't get it. I, I'm, I'm tired of being controlled. You know, there's no need. There, there should be an option of gas or electric or both, whatever, whatever I want to purchase. It shouldn't be forced upon us. And that's and, that, and I think they're jumping on the bandwagon. And I, I think it's short sighted. I really do. But, you know, I understand they're, they yeah, they may they may save some money uh, at the at the assembly line, but they can still save money on the assembly line. And they've been doing it for years. They've been doing it since since, uh, um, you know, Henry Ford when he started the assembly line. So. I don't know. I think it's. I think it's just. Uh, it's ridiculous. And I, I you know, I'm going to want to do things where I don't have to stop and wait for half an hour for my car to charge, every you know every couple hundred miles. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to travel the country. I don't want to have to wait 30 minutes or 60 minutes and stay. And there's a possibility I have to wait in the line. So imagine waiting in line and then having to wait another 30 minutes. It's just. It's and you're having to build a whole new infrastructure. The infrastructure is there. We've already got gasoline. <laughs> so, well, anyway. let's see. Let's see. The stables for our horses were there. The uh, the uh, horse and wagons that delivered hay so that you could feed your horse so you could then pull your buggy the next day was there. Uh, 
look at uh, New York City turn of the century with uh, dirt streets and horse crap all over the place. But, you know, that was... And that was what I mean is, Mike, I know. that the government didn't tell people they couldn't ride horses. Yeah. They didn't make laws. And the, mar the market, horse. but the market brought... The horses carry, and that's yeah, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. If that's what the market does, that's what the market does. But we don't need the politicians in our in our faces telling us what to do all the time. It's happening more and more and more, and this is just another way. We should probably change the subject. We should probably and, move on. No, I understand. I understand where you're coming from. I I share your feelings on that side of things. Yeah. One other thing you might want to think about is. Uh, Okay, you're going on a long trip. You're staying overnight. Does every motel have to have a charging station or multiple charging stations for their guests? Uh, most likely, most hotels do now, but they're obviously they're not, you know, in, in the hundreds. There there might be eight or ten charging stations. Um, but the parallel, I guess, I would draw for you is back when I was working for the army. Uh, they sent me up to Alaska in February on a site survey. I went to uh, Anchorage and uh, Fairbanks and um, I had to rent a car at the airport and I had a motel. And uh, I saw that every car that was sitting in the uh, garage had a, an electric cable sitting in the front of the car. And I said to the the person that was checking me out, what's that for? And they said, it gets well below zero here. And if you don't plug that in, your radiator will crack and you won't be able to drive your car. And you may not, and it also goes to an oil heater and dipstick and the block. It's an oil block heater so that you can get it started. You may not get it started if it's 10 below or 20 below. And the infrastructure's up there for that. And all, of, all the motels had their stands with the cables so that you could plug your cars in so will that kind of infrastructure have to be there for all the electric vehicles yeah eventually it will of some sort a lot of these people that want electric cars are also against nuclear power <laughs> one of the cleanest forms of power there is oh we can't have that it's it's, it's a head scratcher it really is I told a friend about 20 years ago when I lived in Atlanta, 40 years ago, but I don't live anywhere I gotta plug my car in, like Minnesota, to keep it warm. Yeah. You know, there's natural gas also. You know, that all of these buses are natural gas now. And, you know, now there's a fuel source that's pretty clean. And, and you can, don't have to stop for uh, hours to charge up. You, you can fill those natural gas bottles, you know, like a gas tank and you're off. You can also actually buy today um, out in California, Arizona, I think too, hydrogen models of Hyundai's. They're limited, there aren't very many available. And obviously there aren't a lot of hydrogen stations in the infrastructure, but Hyundai Kia has already invested in that, whether they'll continue to do it or not, it's hard to say. Because hydrogen's, you know, it's all around us. You take water, electrolysis, and you've got hydrogen. Clean energy production. Stan, you're muted. Missed your comment. Yeah, thank you. I was just commenting. I, I just feel things are getting a lot more complicated. And uh, I think more they're going to be more expensive. And, and the number of the huge number of cars that are already out there, people are keeping cars 10, 15 years, you know, longer than they used to. And that's going to require gasoline for quite a few years. So it's a uh, 
it's it's a comp your complex issues for, for sure well and there's still people who like to tweak their cars they like to soup them up or change this or change that yeah. that's still going to exist well i don't know if you can do zero to 60 in uh, 2.7 seconds in an electric vehicle there's not much more souping up you could do <laughs> except maybe in the suspension it was funny because Paul and I own Corvettes, so we're we're classic car, power car, whatever you want to call it, enthusiasts. But I went to a competition event called an autocross in Melbourne about a year ago, and uh, mostly Corvettes, some Porsches, uh, some little sport cars that were running around, and one guy who had a Tesla Model Three, and everybody laughed. You know, what, what are you gonna do with that? He says, I'm gonna compete. You can't compete here. This is, you know, this is for sport cars. So, well, I don't care. Let me pay the money and I'll compete. And he did. And uh, he was a class of one. So he was competing in his own class. But as far as overall times, he was extremely competitive with the other vehicles were there because of the acceleration of that electronic, of that electric car. It's instantaneous acceleration. It's there as soon as you step on the accelerator pedal. The torque is amazing on an electric motor compared to a gasoline engine. I wonder what kind of mileage you get on your tires when you have that kind of torque. Yeah. Your tires are still tires. Yeah. New subject, you want to so go around? Speaking, so speaking of yep. uh, automotive stuff, I uh, spent uh, part of the week working on my tailgate on my truck. I uh, did something, I won't say stupid, but uh, I just something, uh, the tailgate was in the wrong position and I had a trailer attached. And um, anyway, it, it put pressure on the top of the tailgate when it was in a horizontal position and it bent the hinges where it wouldn't close anymore. So this happened uh, well over a week ago. So after uh, a day or two, uh, you know, taking these hinges off, it's nothing more than like a, uh, a nub that goes into a cup. That's the hinge and the cup was hollow and the nub was hollow and uh, so, you know, I get the thing in a vice and I, you know, I got the vice grips out in the three pound hammer and uh, I worked on it, you know, a long time. And I got it back like 90, 90%, 95%, something like that, you know, but um, the other side seemed to be okay. It was just the left side. I really couldn't, I really couldn't get it right. So I uh, got on eBay. And um, um, the hinges were like $9 and change. I ended up spending $10 and change. So I said, you know, I'm gonna go buy the hinge. So I got the hinges and, and I put them on and, and the solid hinge was a solid nub rather than a hollow nub. So it can't, it can't distort. So, you know, after playing around, I said, yeah, I think I'm gonna go in this direction. And I tried one, then I tried the other and I tried them both and I went back to the original. I ended up painting them. I put them on the on the car, and kind of that was done. So that was my uh, st stupid thing that I did this week. That was pretty easy to straighten out. That was uh, I can't find the word. It was, wasn't stupidity. It was just an oversight that just kind of happened, you know. But uh, I just didn't realize that could happen. But the other thing, interesting that, that, that kind of happened was in my on my jeep i've got an old gps um and i got two newer ones that are not new but two new ones in my wife's subaru and uh in my corvette and uh, so i every once in a while I need a, a better gps for the jeep so i said you know i'm gonna go see if i can find an inexpensive one on ebay I found one for 35 bucks and it was the same exact one. So I said, well, I know how to use this well. So I ordered it 
And what came was a different model. And after uh, about a half a week, you can see it's much newer. I mean, it looks, you can't tell, but it's got this bracket on the back and, and it's got a, another plug. So, you know, all the buttons are 90% in the same places and I know how to use it. It's a Garmin newbie, but this one uh, had some, you know, I didn't know what I had at first. I, I talked to Garmin. It looked like the thing was in a drawer for three years. Of course, everything was out of date by three years. So it's got lifetime app updates. The, so the software for the map, uh, for the, the software for the GPS was out of date. The maps were out of date. So anyway, um, I just hooked it to my computer. I already got the software on my computer for the other GPSs and I just added this and did the whole update thing. And when I went to drive it, uh, I drove it twice now and found out that it's got traffic, traffic alerts on it. I said, well, it's, I kind of knew that by looking at the specs. I said, oh, it's, it's traffic capable. That's great, you know? So then I'm driving down Colonial and an alert came up that says, you got traffic, you know, slow traffic, a half mile ahead of you for a, a mile. I'll be darned. When I got there, it was right. Now, then I, I got back home, uh, not the same day, but the next day, and I'm still trying to come up to speed on this traffic. Uh, and I found this video and the guy sh talked about the traffic functions of which I knew most of it, but a couple of things that he said on the subscriptions and found out that I've got lifetime subscription on the traffic on, on two different subscriptions, which I uh, don't know if somebody paid for that or if that came with the unit originally. So uh, I'm still in a learning mode on the traffic, but I'm pretty much up to speed on it. And what's real interesting is uh, the power cable, which is thicker than the regular Garmin power cable, has got this little black box on it, which is the antenna. You know, and the other end's the cigarette lighter, but this antenna picks up the traffic signals, which is FM. Now, in my researching everything, and this is just my first shot, and I think what I'm about to say might be right. If you go to another country, you can get different maps. If you want traffic in a different country, you have to get a different traffic subscription. But I think you've got to get a different power cable also, because different countries have different wavelengths for their traffic. So I think that's right. I'm not completely sure, but that's what I've kind of gained by poking around and looking at eBay and looking at what sells. And I say, if you want to go here, you need to So, you know, all of that's well and good. It's nice information, but I don't really care uh, you know, about European traffic. You know, I'm, I'm just going to use it, obviously, in the States here, probably locally, mostly, once in a while, um, to go to a place that I'm not familiar with. But, I like to use GPS rather than my phone. Uh, I can use my phone, but you know, in my GPS, everything gets saved. So and I go back to it most places, you know, more than once. So, um, it would be it would be interesting to hear your follow up if you continue researching that because I've always wondered, you know, how what's the input to all these maps, whether it's Google Maps or GPS maps. What's the input to these maps that you know that allows them then to put a red line and say there's traffic here? Or well, did you, uh, you know, I used to think, well, maybe they've got traffic cameras all over the place and they see it, but I mean, you, you can oh, out on I-95 in the middle of nowhere, here's a wreck and they know. Here's what I think happens. Uh, when the unit's traffic capable, like my, my other Garmin units are not traffic capable. This one's traffic capable. So when it receives a, a signal 
that says you got traffic a half a mile ahead of you, a little icon actually popped up. And then when I hit it, it opened up the map with the traffic on it. And it had some additional notations, but um, that signal has got the information to put the traffic on the map. Oh, where does it come from? It comes, it comes out of the air. I know. Oh, I, I know. What computer processing facility is processing traffic information and what's feeding it? Oh, I see. I see. All, in, all right. infrastructure that creates it. Right. To me, that's, that would be an interesting subject. Yeah, I've, had the, I've had the same, you know, you know like with ways, the people that have ways basically say, mm -hmm. I'm in traffic and it gets input. But where does it come from? Right. So uh, on this, um, it's a great, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know who's uh, sitting everywhere on every street corner, you know, talking to some FM re uh, transmitter. The, the and, satellites are above us and we're all being tracked. <laughs> but I, uh, it's interesting that you're questioning that because I, I just always assumed that it was your own device that was reporting the speed. You're using their, you're using, for instance, Google Maps. I'm using Google Maps. Google, Google knows how fast I'm going. You know, the Google Maps knows how fast I'm going and on what road. And they know all the other people around me that are using their service. I would assume that it's them, that they, they can tell. Uh, if there's a slowdown, I'm slowing down. Therefore, it reports back that I'm slowing down and I should be going, I'm doing 25 and I should be doing a 65, something like that. And then they can mark that as red. It's all automated, of course. But uh, I don't think there's people sitting around looking or uh, that, 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 that was a joke. Okay. No, but this, you know, <laughs> well, I think that's actually and Garmin, Garmin is a separate source, but are they subscribing to Google's information? There's a, there's a lot more people using Google Maps than there are going down Highway 50 with a GPS. Yep. I, I think, you know, but I'm going to call Garmin and ask them where that information comes <laughs> from. If I can find somebody smart enough with the answer. There you go. Because I've already talked to uh, two people this week. Uh, about the unit, the first person, she she was great. She had the answers, and, and she got me going on uh, what I had to do to get this unit functional. And the second guy I pulled up with some very simple questions. Or, you know, uh, uh, this guy was a dummy. I mean, this guy was a dummy. So you know, it all depends. Who, you know, like with any customer service, depends who gets on the phone. So I'm going to have to, at 8 o'clock, take a, I'll be here, but got a five minute uh, um, exit from the Zoom here. OK, just mute yourself. But I'll be here. All right, let's, uh, let's see if we can get back to the world of computers. And, uh, <laughs> I got a few things I can share, Stan, if you want. Okay, please do, Sean. Okay, uh, let's do the uh, screen. I uh, want to set me up for sharing. Yes, I'll do that right now. Glasses. Participants. All right, I've made you co-host, so you can now uh, take care of that. Okay. Um, let's see. So I uh, recently set up, uh, I, I guess you could can compare this to uh, DuckDuckGo, but this is a server, a little, it's a, I installed this as a uh, Docker container on my Synology. And Google is, it, re it returns results from Google, but there's no ads. So, um, uh, Tegra. and this this reminds me of how Google used to be. I don't know if you all used Google back before it was a public company and so forth, but this is what the res results used to look like, and there was no ads. And then they to start making money, they put ads in there, and this is fantastic. So, uh, no ads, everything is clickable. Um, I do have also, and, and this kind of kind of piggybacks on what Mike's email went out about earlier today about, well, kind of uh, those in-app uh, 
in-app browsers that track you and so forth. Right. Um, I don't like that either. I'm not a fan. Um, I also have a, something called Pi-hole. I have a, an ad blocking service on my network that entire my entire network is covered by this. So I don't see, I can't, I can see the ads, but I, I can see the links. Like if I do a regular Google search, I'll see the links for the, the, the uh, ads, but they will not work because it doesn't, it's it, the way the ad blocker is set up is it won't, uh, it won't give feedback to those ads. So two, these are two things. This Google uh, is a Docker container. Pi-hole can also be set up as a Docker container and they can run on a Raspberry Pi. So if you have any, and I would imagine the people, the people here in this meeting uh, have a little bit of technical know-how. It isn't hard to set up a, a, a Raspberry Pi, and, although they're quite expensive now, unfortunately, because everything else is. But um, you can set up a little Raspberry Pi put on your network and then point your web browser to that Raspberry Pi that's running Google, and all your results come back without ads, which is nice. And if you have the Pi hole set up, even if you did come across an ad, it would either show just a single pixel on your screen or it would just uh, error out. It wouldn't, wouldn't actually get you to an ad. Um, but the Google is great. I don't know if anybody here know with the DuckDuckGo, do you ever see any ads in DuckDuckGo? Um, well, let me just, I actually, I I go to, to, I'd have to do it, but hang on a second. It's my full screen. and. Go to a browser. I'll just go to my Chrome browser, and then that has DuckDuckGo in it. I'll see if it does. Uh, DuckDuckGo. And let's just. Uh, you said Acura, so A C U R A. Oh, I do see ads. Acura. Um, says that we're search. You're searching privately with DuckDuckGo. We keep your search history. Private block most trackers as you browse. Yeah. Um, so I just did a I just did a search for the, the same search on DuckDuckGo. As you can see, I click on it, and it actually does return ads. I see an ad here. Yeah. 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 I'm seeing uh, the same thing. Yeah. So no. the, the Google the Google search, and I don't know why that went through. Because I should, I'm not supposed to, this must not, no, not have been a tracker ad. Um, but the Google search is a totally different types of type of results. Right, I see. It, it looks, this looks like the original Google. If you remember back 25, 22 years ago, 23 years ago, whenever they started. Um, I love it. I'm very happy with this. And it's just sitting as a, as a little Docker container. So... But yeah, yeah. Not go. I like that they don't do the tracking. That's that's great. And this looks more like a Google, the current Google search. Even, even with the, the subheadings up here. So anyway, I'm a fan. If anybody ever wants assistance with setting up a Pi hole or setting up a, a Raspberry Pi, reach out to me. I'd be happy to, to help out. Um, also, I don't know if you saw the news recently, but uh, NASA released what a black hole sounds like. Yes. Anybody see that? Or did anybody listen to it? Yep. I'm going to play it here. <laughs> not hearing it. You're not? No. Did you, when you shared your screen, did you click share sound? I don't know how to do that. Let me see. All right, so unshare your screen and then go back to your share screen controls. And there's a little box at the lower, at the bottom to uh, to share sound at the same time. Oh, okay. So stop sharing. Yep. Then share, and, share screen. I see, okay. And then ah, share sound, okay. And this one here. Oh. There we go. All right, now it's started. Yeah. We should hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like it, it, it sounds like it came from a science fiction movie. 
It does, doesn't it? Pretty creepy. Anyway, yeah, that's I thought I found that fascinating. We'll never ex ever see a black I mean, other than just, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting. It sounds, like, it sounds like it's right out of the uh, original Star Trek uh, episode. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder if that's really a black hole. I mean, how do they know this stuff? You know, they also used to say they used to say that uh, the Big Bang was the start of everything. Now there's now they're saying that's not true. Okay. You mean a week ago it was true, but now it's not. Okay, well, what's whatever's true now is is true. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> my latest Amazon purchase are these things. Uh, if anybody's got USB C, something that's USB C, and you need to plug it into a regular USB, uh, that's these things. Four of these for nine dollars. So that was a pretty good price yeah. on yep, Amazon. I I have a collection of those myself. Do you? Yeah. Um, and I have, I think I've shown this before, but I just love it. I have a iPhone and uh, they make this kind of case for, I think all the different phones and including like Androids and so forth, but it's a, it's a holder for your visit for your credit cards. You can put three cards and, you know, driver's license and a couple of credit cards or whatever. Uh, and but the 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 um, the flap is magnetic and it doubles as a stand. So uh, very very handy. Um, I love it. It's by a company called Vina, and uh, I've had this is my my third or fourth phone that I've purchased one of these cases for. I've had these all up for many years and. Uh, so if you're looking for a new a case for your phone, a uh, Vina case, and they sell them on Amazon. And you can see they're not, they're a little bit pricier than, you know, some of the cheaper ones, but I, I consider that to be, a, and it's a, good, it's a good sturdy phone case and I've, I have dropped it and it doesn't, it hasn't broken or anything. Um, so anyway, I bought one of these for my wife recently. That's why I had it in my purchase history. She has the same phone that I have. And I, she has, this is also her, second or third of these kind of cases. And uh, she really likes it as well. I've gotten down to the point where I only carry two credit cards and a, and my driver's license and my phone and then my car key. So I, I, I try to be as minimal as possible. So problem with the magnets on that interfering with the strip on the credit card? Not in the four years I've, or four phone, over the four phones that I've had. Okay. Nope. Of course, most of them use the chip now anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, once in a blue moon, I do have to use the magnetic strip and it, it doesn't cause a problem. So that's it for me, Stan. Okay, thank you, Sean. Very interesting. By the way, are you uh, still taking notes and going to send out the uh, minutes of the, effectively the minutes of this meeting? I think you know I haven't I haven't done it since you started recording. You've been recording them, right? Not always. Oh. But but this there is a live hard. transcript. There is a live transcript, so that could be that. Could yeah. Be, you know. uh, I I can I can I can take notes. Uh, mm -hmm. I have I haven't done this meeting though. Sorry, I didn't realize you you wanted that. Well, like like uh, I I made a note of the Google instead of Google, but uh, you know I, I not everyone is going to go listen to the uh, complete recording to come up with one or two small you know just the references of what we talked right. about. That'd be great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Tom Alt has joined us. Yeah, I had a hard time getting on tonight for some reason. It took me an hour to get hooked up. Hi, Tom. How, yeah, are you doing? how are you? My T Mobile just keeps getting faster. <laughs> uh, we hit 700 once, but normally my iPhone's about 50 and my iPads are about 250. Which oh, did you, did you invest in their uh, 
house-based internet? Yeah, I had it. It started out a lot slower, but I was going to the summer and when I come back, they had improved the, the, a tower close to me, apparently. Because I get yeah. 250 down on almost everything. And, and, uh, and, and in your house, do you get a 4G signal or a 5G signal? Get a what? It's 5G. 5G? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't have that at home. <laughs> It re and it really it really does depend on the uh, where you're located. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very dependent on the speed that you get. Because I, I recommended uh, the T-Mobile Home Internet. I was very impressed with Tom's speed. And by the way, Tom, I think that 700 was uh, an anomaly, and it was probably because it was a cached. I don't think it, you actually got that speed. But your speed is fantastic. Whether you 700 was on your computer. But... Yeah, I think it was a cache thing. Uh, but but still, you're getting in the over well over a hundred megabits per second. That's great. On my uh, iPads, I'm getting two fifty, and on my iPhone, I'm getting over four hundred. I don't know, maybe my iPhone. The other iPads are older, so I don't know if that makes a difference or not. That's fantastic. Um, I recommended a, a, another one, one of my clients to purchase the uh, T-Mobile Home Internet, and she lives in College Park, and uh, she didn't get anything faster than about six. So, uh, you know, your speed varies literally by where you are in relation to the tower. I was very disappointed because I, I really talked it up. I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, she was looking to get rid of, you know, they were jacking her price. You know, the spectrum is just awful. I just, I am not, a, I like their service and there, that's where it ends. Uh, they're, they jack, they don't have any loyalty to their customers. Even if your customer is loyal to you, they don't care. They jack up your prices every uh, every chance they can get. So, uh, and she was at that point, and she's on a fixed income. You know, she were her her prices were going well over a hundred bucks, and she did have cable TV, but she they were still uh, on. And she and she had the FCC uh, the the discount because she's a senior citizen. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So I tried to get her on the T-Mobile, and we we gave it our best shot, but she wound up taking it back. It was. Uh, oh, they don't charge you anything if you don't like it. I don't think. I think they, they charge her. She had it for a week. So I think she got a. They charge her like forty bucks, something like that. But oh, uh, they told me. Oh yeah, okay. But they, you know, they didn't charge me for the. The hardware, and the thing is, when I I got it on my line going out to my shop, my shop, I'm only getting about a hundred down. But that's all right. I don't need more than a hundred out here. In fact, that's what I'm talking on now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a great setup there. Yeah, from 12 down and 0.9 up, that was a big improvement and $15 a month cheaper. Yeah, and that AT&T, they can take a flying uh, whatever. Yeah. So. <laughs> but I heard, I heard they got a fast internet out too now. Well, hardware. Uh, the, fiber, the fiber, the fiber is. Yeah. Fiber. Yeah. And they don't have fiber to, fiber to your house, do they? Oh, no, not me. I don't have nothing out here. Yeah, like they I've had said, fiber for a while. I mean, they probably were the original yeah, fiber, right? Well, well, I had fiber across the street, but they wouldn't hook me up, so it wouldn't cost effective. Right. <laughs> so I'm pretty tickled. Good. Oh, and, I, and remember, I told you, uh, I was traveling in my... Uh, fifth wheel this summer and I'm running into another guy that's a full-time fifth wheeler and he was all over uh, the western and northern states and uh, they told him to turn his uh, hardware in when he left and he went back to the store and the guy said the guy just told him just keep it and see what you get and he said everywhere he's been he's got really good downloads so wow that's great. that's great that's yeah. great uh, you know, that's encouraging because uh, Hello, Jim. I'm busy, Jim. <laughs> hey, I, I'm at a meeting. I'll call you back in a little bit. Oh, um, that's really encouraging about the uh, about the T-Mobile. Uh, because my wife and I would like to, when we retire, we'd like to get a, a travel trailer like you have 
and, uh, and travel around the country and she can work remotely. We both could. And uh, having the T-Mobile in combination with the uh, Starlink, having both of those services, we pretty much could cover the entire country uh, and not have to worry about having, we'd have to be probably more concerned about whether or not we'd have electricity. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, if you, if you don't rent for the night and you don't have a generator, you're out of electricity. Right. Yeah. So, you, we'd probably do the uh, solar on the roof, but, uh, Oh, yeah. Hey, I looked those trainers up <laughs> a new one, a 33 foot ones about, uh, 200,000. <laughs> It was 155,000, yeah. I think it was. I was surprised. I didn't think it was that expensive. For the Airstream? Yeah, a new one. Yeah, they're pretty expensive, aren't they? That's the classic. But I, a lot of people that are full timers now, some of them have really good solar where they can run their air conditioner and everything else for at least 24 hours without any sun, even. So. But it's an expensive setup because you got some real expensive batteries and you got all the solar stuff to put in. But some people have done it, and I see it on the uh, internet, YouTube, all the time. Yeah, I think you're looking at about fifth, between fifteen and eighteen thousand for uh, the full setup on that. Yeah, and they got another thing though that uh, actually you can put on your home air conditioner too. If your uh, electric goes out and you don't have a real great big generator, if you got a slow start in your air conditioner. Uh, like mine's got two one tons. My 30 amp will only run one. But if I had two slow starts on my air conditioners, I could run both of them and have juice left over because it's not the. It's the startup amperage. Yeah, the current. Yeah. We have a, a Generac uh, whole house backup, which will also back up. Our two AC units. I've got a small mini split and a large AC unit, but Generac comes with these little boxes that it's it's more than slow start. It actually times out, and it it uh, will it won't turn the AC on until everything else in the house is is covered with the backup, and then it'll turn the first unit on. Wait five minutes and turn the second unit on. And what might, fuel source do you use? And it's it's um, propane. I've got a 500 gallon propane tank in our backyard. Does the propane go bad? No. Good. And in the last, well, it's been, let's see, it's been a year and Almost, almost two years now, a year and a half, I'll say, that it's been in. Um, and last year, at the beginning of hurricane season, I checked the gauge, and it was only down 10% from full. And this year, when I had the generator service, we went out and looked at the gauge, and it's down another 10%. So I still have 80% of my tank after two years. And other than a weekly... Uh, run of 15 minutes. Uh, there was one power outage. I think it was due to a transformer, and it was out for about nine hours. And that's the only time the generator has run, you know, the whole house for a long period of time. And I'm still sitting with around 80% of my propane, so I don't. I won't need a a, a fuel top off. At least for this hurricane season, knock on wood. Mike, that uh, you said you have a mini split. Yeah. Did you install that yourself, or did you have somebody install that? I had the uh, Energy Air, which was the company that that was that was maintaining our system at the time. I've since gone to a different uh, contractor. Is that something you think you could have done yourself? Not me, 20 yeah. years, 20 years ago, maybe. Okay, <laughs> so it was recent? Yeah, uh, this has been here, I would say five years. My office is, house is basically a rectangular floor plan with the AC unit and the 
front in the garage on the right hand side and my office is in back on the right hand side. So the ductwork has to come all the way across the house over the top and down. And it's a single five inch, well, originally it had been a three inch duct, but we've replaced it to a five inch. So it's seeing a single ceiling duct coming down. And I've got two computers running in here, uh, all kinds of stuff that runs and put out, puts out heat. So the mini split is located on the other side of the house and it just pipes the air into your office? No, the mini split is located on the wall right above me in my back office. And the little compressor for it is right outside on the back. Okay. And okay. It, in order to keep this office comfortable, I had to set the main house temperature down to about 68, something like that. Of course, it was my wife was always saying it's cold in the house. And yeah, it's pretty chilly. And that's not very efficient. Right. I go through and I changed the, you know, the duct yeah. settings and try to block off the rooms that didn't need it. And it just never worked out. So right. Finally, yeah. we changed our HVAC. A year before we changed the HVAC, I went ahead and had a mini split put in back here. That let me put the house temperature at about 78. And then this thing I've got, I don't know what it's set to, it's probably set to 77, 76. That what does what does something like that go for? Do you know? Off the top of my head, I'm going to say maybe 3,000, maybe a little less. Okay. The, it's over spec. They told me it was over spec that, that I have this small compressor that's outside that if I wanted to have another room, also, I could have piped in a second indoor unit. But I have, you know, I don't need to do that. Right. Is it a is it a Mitsubishi or what's out? What do you got outside? It's Mitsubishi. Yeah. They're very they're very efficient. Yeah. And it runs on one ten. No, it's two twenty. Who is it? Which is more which is more efficient anyway. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Who, who's next? Uh, well, let's see. I um, has anybody ever been introduced recently to the? I don't know. Huey's been uh, told me about it uh, a few weeks ago. A file searching tool called Everything. Yes, he's he's shown that to <clears throat> to all of us. That that is really uh, amazing. No question. Um, I put together after I took a look at it. Um, I saw that it's, it has a lot of complex features that not a lot of people are necessarily willing to delve into. So um, I published on the internet a, like a, a, a guide that covers all of the common features that people might want to use, uh, such as searching for duplicate files. You know, I don't know that people know that it has a very good duplicate file finder. Um, and can search, you know, has, has a lot of search capability, including Boolean search capability. And so what I did is I took their 10-page uh, guide and crumbled it down into a small web page. Um, can you put the uh, link in chat? Um, I can. Um, I happen to be one of the people that still uses the uh, web software Evernote. And so the link is going to be an Evernote link. It's going to come off of the Evernote website. And it's uh, a web page that will be uh, part of my account. Um, that goes into chat. Everybody can, is welcome to offer some feedback, make it any better. Um, but it covers a lot of the uh, nice features of the product. Thank you. What attracted me to it was what Huey started his presentation on by saying, have you ever saved something 
that you've been working on or that you got as a download and immediately forgotten where you put it and went looking for it and not been able to find it. Yes. And, and everything, as long as you know that it's a Word file or a PDF file or a JPEG file, music file, whatever it is, and you just open up everything, go up to search for MP3s and sort by most recent, and there it is. Yes, all- and I, I found, I'm a, uh, one of the early members of the Boston Network Users Group. I moved to Florida from Boston. And uh, the night that I loaded everything, I was doing some searching around for, for files. And apparently I had uh, received a copy of the charter of the Boston Network Users Group. And I had opened it up in Word and Word must have crashed and corrupted my file. And I found a copy, a backup copy of the charter located hidden in amongst all of the web of folders that are part of where Word stores all of its temporary files. Found that very interesting. I was able to recover a file that I uh, had lost years and years ago. Um, but it's a quite a powerful tool if you're willing to, if you, if you look through the guide, you can find, um, it has a lot of functions that find, um, like if you type in docx, obviously it finds word files only. Uh, if you type in doc colon, it will find any and all document types that it is aware of finding. So it'll find, uh, word files as well as text files. Um, if you want to search for any type of document and have that covered in the guide as well. Sounds good. Thank you. I do not know that for sure. Uh, okay. I think I'm going to have to leave. So, uh, Thank you, folks, for all the comments you've made and all the information you've presented. And I will try to see you next month. Okay. Good seeing you, Dick. Take care. Take care, Dick. Yep. Today, and uh, I don't know if everybody knows, today is election uh, primary day. Yes. In Florida, which is why Huey's not on the meeting, I think. Because yes. he told me that he was a volunteer. Well, he's a paid worker, a poll worker. Oh, he's a paid poll worker. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He has to be there early in the morning. He won't be home until eight, nine o'clock. I'm sure he's pooped. Is he like a volunteer to... job with that? No, I think he's. I think he's one of the county uh, poll workers. It's a two hundred and seventy-five dollar day pay. Uh, you, you have to apply for it. They give you three days of training. You, you have to bring your own meals. You can't leave the premises. It, it's quite grueling. Uh, he, I thought he did it for a couple of years and was going to take a break for a while, but I, I guess he, he, he just let us know the other day that he was going to be doing it today. So, But actually, I wouldn't mind turning on the TV and seeing who's, uh, who's pulling ahead. Well, my Anybody else got anything? My wife just talked to me, and I think Charlie Crisp won, and uh, Val Demings won also, and uh, I think Frost won, and I don't remember what else she told me. Well, we'll, we'll all see tomorrow morning what the results are, I guess. For our respective parties, the big one will be in November. The one thing I do like is the technology of of the uh, voting at the present time. Uh, Originally, my wife and I decided we would do early voting because of the controversy on mail-in ballots. And then um, we had previously registered for mail-in ballots and our county decided that they were going to send it to us anyway, even though we hadn't 
sent yet in another statement, hey, yeah, send us the mail-in ballots. They came. So, all right. So what I did instead is I went to the early voting place with our mail-in ballots. They had a, two people there, I guess uh, a, a, a watcher and a poll worker. And they said, just put it into the box. And it was right at the front door of the library where they were doing early voting. And the next day in the morning, I had both a text and an email stating that your ballot has been received and counted. So I know that way, the only way I know that that happened, I guess, is that the barcode is on the outside of the envelope has your information on it. And then that information is somehow coded onto the ballot itself as far as the ballot number. So they were able to say it's been logged in and received by the system and then it's been run through the machine and recorded. And that was pretty quick. When I voted last Friday, I went to the library and I walked in and um, there was like a table that preceded the room you went into. So I stopped because there were people there that I hadn't realized they were doing something else, whatever it was. There was two or three people there. So I stopped, I figured I'm, not, I'm on the end of this line. And then the people in the room kept waving me in. And uh, I said, well, no, they're first. And they said, come in, come in, come in. So I came in and I was like number one. And uh, the room was uh, pretty, you know, I went in the morning. It was no trouble getting a parking spot. It was extremely light on that Friday, which was, uh, I think Saturday was the last day. I didn't want to go Saturday. I went flying Saturday. so. I want to keep uh, Saturday open for myself. But I went Friday and it was just like, I just walked right in, showed her my license and bing, bang, boom, done. It, it was the most uncrowded that I re really remember. Now, of course, that's not counting time of day. Uh, you know, if I went earlier in other years, different elections. So I'm just saying, that day was light, which surprised me. I never seen it that light. So no trouble getting a parking spot at the library. A lot of spots open. Well, the primaries for non-presidential elections are always quite quite a bit lighter than the actual election, the actual vote uh, per se, which will be in November, of course. All right. Anybody else uh, have more that they want to? Come up with, or shall we call it a night? I'll go ahead and start. Well, well, I have a topic that I'll cover um, next month that I am going to prepare some notes for it. Um, I uh, have a new one. My VPN provider just came out with a new product that provides um, what they call mesh networking, which allows you to interconnect all of your devices over a secure encrypted network. Thought that might be an interesting topic to discuss. Yeah. I do have a, uh, since we're here, and since I'm thinking about it, when you said mesh, all of a sudden I'm thinking internet, and then I'm thinking cameras. So this might go out to maybe Mike and Sean, maybe to answer, but you know, I've got that uh, NVR. Um, Lorex system with the eight cameras, everything works okay. And, uh, but I would like to see other parts of my property and house. And I know, and I don't want to go to the length of getting another NVR and, and, and doing all that stuff. But I was wondering if I could throw up some independent cameras that would obviously interface with my um, with my uh, internet network in the house. Um, I haven't figured out the power source, how I would actually do it. I guess it depends where I put it, you know, but, you know, I know you guys have talked about cameras that just come in on a URL that you could just log into. And I was wondering what, 
brand. Oh, uh, one, one, of, one of the popular companies is a company called Foscam. Uh, F O. I think it's F O S C A M. They they make uh, generic internet based uh, cameras that you can put on your property and uh, control them with as little as a web browser from anywhere in the world. And you can rotate the camera, listen to the camera, do things like that. It just but, needs to. And then but, they, but they the, make them now that have um, batteries. Like, like my ring doorbell no longer has, doesn't have electricity. It runs off a battery that I charge up every few months. You can do that with Wi-Fi cameras today, where every once every two or three months you recharge the battery. Okay, so, uh, Paul. There's also uh, Lorex does make Wi-Fi cameras that could integrate with your existing uh, unit. You just now, uh, like you said, you'd have to have the power. But uh, I put a link to the Lorex Wi-Fi security cameras. You have to make sure that it works with your particular NVR, but you could add that in well, there. I, I, I really I really didn't want to go through my NVR. I really just okay. want to do an internet-based connection. And, um, you know, I didn't know the longevity of the batteries in some of these units in lieu of hooking up like a 12-volt power supply run by 110, you know. Uh, so I know you guys have played with that a lot and I talked about it for years and I made notes, but you know, I really don't have those notes uh, anymore. You know, and obviously the ones I'm gonna really be needing would be for outdoor outdoor use. So, um, you know, I'm just kind of thinking about that and dabbling with it because I'd like to see some of the places on the property with an internet range. And I don't really know what the complete internet range is, but now that I've moved my uh, router and uh, modem about, I don't know, a year and a half ago, whenever that was, I get much better coverage throughout the house and, and outside the house. And, and, and I'm thinking, hey, there's some places that I might be able to put a camera you know, that I could just log into these cameras and just kind of take a peek every once in a while when I'm not at home. That's kind of, you know, I got my property kind of covered with the Lorex. Um, well, my house and the driveway and, you know, the normal stuff. But there's some other areas I'd like to maybe have a camera, see what's going on. So, uh, you know, uh, I have uh, used the, I don't know, they're very inexpensive, the Wise Cam. Wise. W -Y -Z -E. Right. I remember. Uh, and those, those are, but they're not battery operated. So, but you can get them with a, um, you can get them with a solar panel. Uh, so you see mounted in a tree. You put the solar panel up, you plug it into the, you know, plug it in the camera into that. And uh, it provides, and there's probably a little battery in there of some sort, and then it provides the power. Um, but I have wise cams at my dad's house, and they've been working. I was up there a year ago and plugged them all in, and I'm able to kind of keep an eye on him when he's outside and stuff. And they work pretty, for, for the price of the camera, which is about 30, 35 bucks, uh, I, you'd be surprised at how good the, uh, the picture is. It's, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty decent. Okay, yeah, I I couldn't remember any of the names. I, I just really went blank. Wise Cam, I know you talked about that. A yeah, lot. Wise Wise Cam, and the that the thirty thirty five bucks is without the the solar panels. Another forty or fifty bucks, I think it's it's a decent amount of money. But yeah, you know, that's still not bad when you think about it. Even if you pay sixty dollars for yeah. a camera that's wireless, oh, completely yeah. wireless. Yeah, the Lorex cameras are expensive. Mm -hmm. No. So, all right, great. And how's the air conditioning? Still doing okay? It is. Thank you. Okay. Doing great. Yeah. So. All right. Okay. okay. I, I will, um, when I stop recording, I will also have the chat in there too. So in the text, I'll send that out. 
and then uh, Sean, if you want, if you want, unless you want to grab the chat now, um, but when it's when it's up on, um, I, I may try what Huey was saying. It, he said that since we've had the uh, the screen recording, what's it the what do they call it the uh, yes. transcript? Yeah, you know, transcript. So that that has been on this whole time. So we'll have to see if that is fed into YouTube that they can actually put that into the notes on the uh, video on YouTube. I haven't tried that, so I'll have to talk. To I'm you. going to do that myself now because since I started it, it made me that, and I I have a saved transcript that I'm oh okay I've just done. Checking where it is. Uh, well, I'll have the video. Uh, oh, it, anybody can independently save the transcript. Yeah, anybody can save the transcript. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just but, did something. But Huey was saying that if you actually, at the time you create the video, um, there's a, in one of the interactive screens as an originator, you can put a transcript up and it will show up in the, in the notes somehow. I haven't seen how that works, but we'll see. Okay. Well, thanks for doing that, Mike. And uh, well, I just did something really dumb. I lost, I lost the picture of you guys. I can hear you, but I. And we see I you. Dropped, yeah, I dropped that somehow. <laughs> I uh, clicked the invisible on invisible man. Huh? The invisible man. <sighs> we see you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm on the Lorex website, but I lost the, uh, the Zoom. Okay, well, thanks all for coming. Okay. Stay safe. See you next month. Okay.